Hi, I'm Barbara Dye, Executive Director of the PVP Land Conservancy, and I'm glad to welcome you all to today's August Walk for the Land Conservancy. As you know, we have one on the second Saturday of every month. Today we have a really special opportunity because we're going to get to take you through the middle of the old marine land property, uh, which has been closed off for all this time before it moves into its next phase of existence as a hotel with a lot of parkland and trails, which you're going to hear about in a minute. Just before we start the walk, we've asked Todd Major, who is a vice president with the Low Development that is putting the resort hotel in here. And Todd is going to tell you a little bit about what's about to start here and emphasize some of the environmental aspects of this project that has gone all the way through the approval process, through the City Council, through the Coastal Commission, and everything else, and is just about to start one. So I'll hand it over to Todd for a few minutes. Thanks, Barbara. Um, well, as, as Barbara mentioned, we're, we're just kind of on the and we're about two months away. We're with the, literally at the last one yard line now of meeting all those conditions and actually being able to start grading. But the wonderful thing that's happened as a result of those conditions, albeit very expensive, is that this is going to be a one-of-a-kind resort, uh, unlike any probably I, I know of definitely in Southern California, if not the entire coast of North America. Um, what we're doing to kind of give you a, a little update about what the program is. It's a 360 room hotel, 60,000 square foot conference center. We've got a 20,000 square foot spa. We've got these villas and casitas uh, kind of winging the, the, the hotel. They're, they're limited use. You can only use them for 60 or 90 days a year. And they sold out in two hours in our first launch. So uh, those are pretty much all spoken for. Um, start because you can see the hills behind us. Let me just say a few words about the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy. As many of you know, we were founded in 1988 by Bill Ayler with the goal of preserving open space on the peninsula. Uh, we're not an anti-development group. We never have been. We've never taken a position for or against any development project. Our goal is to work with cities, work with uh, property owners to give them tax benefits, um, for some of our properties, the donations have been because the families wanted preservation and the combination of preservation and a tax benefit made the difference for them. Or just to get the money together to buy the land. And as many of you know, this past uh, in 2005, with the help of many of you of this whole community and with the help of the state of California and the bond measures that you, I'm sure many of you have voted for, that money came back to Palos Verdes and we got uh, 11 million in state bond money, a million in county bond money. The city put in money and you, the community, raised $4 million to buy the piece of land that we're looking at sort of straight over there, the open space and the hills there. Not only did the city acquire that and place a conservation easement over it in favor of the Land Conservancy, it also established the 1,200-acre Portuguese Bend Nature Preserve, which is so exciting. It's that property, property right here, property around City Hall. The, all, pretty much all of the open space you can see over there, the forest all preserve that was purchased in 96, um, all of Abalone Cove and all that area is now under management for habitat value, for public access, for rare and endangered species. So lots of great things happening and I'll talk a little more about some of the processes that are underway in a little bit. So um, we have one more major acquisition there that we'd like to make, piece of land we'd like to buy, but um, we've made some real, real accomplished many of our goals in the last year and it's very exciting. Today's walk is a little different because there's not as much habitat but there's a lot of geology, there's a lot of history here that we're gonna we're gonna see. There's one tiny patch of habitat and uh, we thought people would enjoy seeing this site before construction starts. So let's move on. talking about the cliff around us, it's sort of general geology. We'll do more down, but I'll do part one of geology here. Mm 
There's a lot of really cool geology we're about to see on this site. Uh, let me just give you a basic geology lesson, which was like 12 to 15 million years ago, this area was a shallow sea. You had um, the usual things that you would have going on in a shallow sea. You had uh, deposition of silt coming down from the rivers, creating shales. You had an occasional storm that would do a thick bed of, say, mudstone. You had um, creatures living in the ocean. You had these very cool creatures called diatomes, which are really the only creatures that have sil skeletons made of silica. So they're much harder. If you all have heard of diatomaceous earth, the reason diatomaceous earth works is it's the skeletons of these microscopic creatures. And they form, when they die in great groups, they form like a powder. And because silica, quartz, is very, very hard, it's an abrasive. And it's also a really good filter because their skeletons are, look like almost like jacks. You know, the kids game jacks, they have all these points on them. So it makes a really good uh, uh, filter and, and abrasive. Also in this ocean, you had a lot of fish. And I don't know if I'll be able to find a fish scale today, but it, whenever you see those, what we call PV stone, which by the way, is not a geology term, it's a landscaping term. Um, there's really in geology no such thing, it's the Altamira shale. But when you see those, you look at them, when you see the little tiny round brown circles about as big as your baby fingernail um, with the concentric circles, those are fish scales. And they actually look exactly like fish scales with the rays in them and everything. Of course, kids today mostly haven't ever seen fish scales because their fish comes breaded and cleaned. But when you look, once you know what you're looking for, you realize just how many of the rocks here have fish scales in them. They also have bones, shark teeth, and lots of um, marine mammal fo uh, fossils. So you get the bones of dolphins and small whales. In fact, over at the Forestall property is the first place they ever discovered fossil baleen, which is the stuff that the baleen whales used to uh, sift the krill, like to get the little shrimpy things, and then they use their tongue. And they weren't sure how long baleen whales had been on the earth, and they, they realized they'd been here 12 to 15 million years because they found it here first. So lots of cool marine fossils in this area. Best, great place to learn about that is the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, new reopened, wonderful asset to our community. So anyway, okay, so you've got these things, you've got fossils going down in them, but you also had something else going on. You had volcanoes. You had volcanoes in the area doing a whole bunch of different things. You had some volcanoes doing Mount St. Helens kind of explosions with volcanic ash going into the ocean. And so you'd get large beds of, of volcanic ash that then became in the clay that becomes slippery when it gets wet. You also had the ash fall down and then currents and so forth would collect it. So you have a lot of lenses and pockets of, the, of this um, stuff. So that's why there's so many arguments among the geologists. Well, is this the upper bentonite or is this the upper bentonite? Because it's not always clear which are the big beds and which are the smaller beds. Did this little volcano give off a little over here or whatever? And then also you had lava and you had these, you had magma coming up from under the earth. And we're going to walk by the top of a magma dome later in this walk. You also had it squeeze into all the cracks and come up toward the surface. And as it did, it, it heated up all the water and cooked all the rocks around where it was coming in. So wherever you have it coming up through a crack and you have lava flows, you usually have a point. And it's not the lava that's so hard, it's all the rock around it that got cooked by the intrusion of the lava. And then the last thing that happened was as, the, as everything cooled down, you had all this water full of chemicals that left behind beautiful crystals. So you have lots of different kinds of crystals. You have barite, you have dolomite, you have quartz in the rocks, in the cracks. So as we go down here, we're gonna see more stuff like that as we go down. be able to walk in this area after the whole place is built or they have this area sort of, uh... have a whole lot of habitat here but this is one of our native plants this is called salt bush it's uh it can grow in very salty soil hence the name it's a very nice landscaping plant grows quite quickly um, there is another rare salt bush that at this point is only found in the habitat areas at trump national on this peninsula but this is a native plant most of the other things around us are not Behind me, we have our least favorite plant, which is fennel or anise or um, 
has a couple licorice plant, some people call it. It's an import from the Mediterranean, very similar climate. The thing about the invasives that we don't like is that when they come in, they generally drive everything else out and you will see a field of one kind of plant. Whereas our native plants that belong on this peninsula all grow together and you can have an assortment of different bugs and birds and so forth because they all use different plants. For example, pampas grass, which is very pretty, in the pan where it grows naturally, which is not the pampas in fact, um, there are birds that eat its seed, things that live in it, things that use the fronds for nests and stuff. Here nothing does. It might as well be asphalt environmentally. So you can see why what, one of the things when we manage property is we are trying to get rid of the invasive non-natives and put in native plants. You see here this tall little tree thing here is called tree tobacco. Though some disagree, I've been told that the, uh, it does have nicotine in the sap and that the hummingbirds get addicted to the nicotine and keep pollinating it. When you think about it, it's really logical that a plant would develop. Why would you develop that? Well, it's a survival factor. So do we have room to keep moving down? Or? Okay, well, head down. Kind of, I know everybody can't hear me here and I try to get my group to hear. a rock in your hand you can take it with you you can't take shells you can't take plants you shouldn't pick plants unless they're invasives and you're sure of it um, this is um, some very nice little barite crystals right here that you can see the sun on in these rocks so uh, they're gonna have lots of rock because they're gonna have to do a lot of grading on this property they're gonna have a lot of rock to get rid of in fact the entire marine land site once had cliffs this tall vertical into the ocean and when they developed the marine land property they graded it down and graded those rocks created this area here and created some new areas so that they would have the areas on the oceanarium would have a better view so I had not known that until really recently um, staying on plants for just a minute this is an invasive called rabbit foot grass right here spreads you can see it along the sides of the road spreads very rapidly the native grasses are the native bunch grasses are very pretty and a little just not as good a competitor they live to be a hun the hundred years native bunch grasses so they didn't need a lot of seeds but then these uh i think this is actually a perennial come in and just are more efficient and drive out the native ones which are often the food source for a particular kind of creature up there on the cliff you can see ashy leaf buckwheat which is a wonderful native plant it looks nice mo this is like the worst it looks but it really looks good most of the year round and it's an important butterfly plant um, over there behind you is the pump house for the, this is where the pump house was for marine land. It, they, all of the tanks were, uh, filled with ocean water. So they would, they had an intake out in the ocean that would pump in the wa clean water and pump it up into all the tanks. And then one of the reasons why there were always sea lions there is because they took the old water full of fish bits and dumped it out into the ocean. And we're going to go to where that was dumped. And so there were lots of animals. Animals aren't stupid free food. They're going to hang out there. So that, you know, marine land really changed the ecosystem of this general area. But I think most of us feel it was a positive thing. One more plant is this one right here with the brown seeds and um, this is a plant called castor bean it was brought in for its ornamental qualities but this is one of the most poisonous plants on earth it's the it's its latin name is ricinus because its seed looks like a tick and it means tick it is what they make ricin gas from the poison gas that you hear about in um, chemical warfare and one seed can kill a child it's what they made castor bean oil from and of course castor bean oil was meant to essentially poison you and take everything purge your system so um, that's one of the plants that grows very quickly and again we'd like to get rid of and see replaced with some of the native plants i think we can walk a little bit ahead because i suspect another group's going to be coming right behind me. <laughs> Uh, I was talking about the geology of the peninsula and how extraordinarily interesting it is. And I didn't quite finish the, what went on here, 
So, okay, we've got these, uh, these, the shallow sea, we've got all this volcanic stuff going on. Then we had a change in um, plate tectonics that squeezed the whole peninsula and caused all of the rocks to bow up to in a dome like this. And then, you know, it cracked at the top and a little bit fell down and that's Deep Valley. You know, our whole peninsula is a dome. So the houses on the top are built on flat rock and they're just fine. But the ones on the edges that, you know, angle down to the ocean, when they've got the clay layers in there and they get wet, it doesn't take a rocket scientist though, knowing this crowd, you probably, some of you are rocket scientists. Um, <laughs> but you gotta remember that you've also had these intrusions, cooking the rocks and changing them. And so you can have something completely stable, like the Wayfarer's Chapel, which is on a way uh, of igneous intrusion, right next to the, the other building next to it. Remember how that was sliding down and right side by side, one stable, one not. So you can't always tell what, what's going on. But behind me, you can see some really cool cliffs. You can see some basic um, sedimentary layers right there. There's a big fault right through, and there's a couple layers that as we go over, you can trace across the fault and see how they're broken. You've had a lot of alteration in this area by solutions coming in, and then the solutions pick up chemicals, especially the silica from the diatomes, and then deposit them, you know, they, they go through and they find some other silica and they join together and they make chert, and then they make uh, quartz layers in the beds and they harden everything. So the processes that happened afterwards with these hot solutions also affected the rocks. So you've had a lot of alteration. In this area, you've also had faults. You've had this whole thing moving. So you've got stuff coming up from underneath. You've got stuff moving like this with faulting and folding. And you can see the trace of it all in the cliff here. This is a place a lot of geology classes come to study what, about the geology. Now, our next thing is I do want to take as many of you who are comfortable doing it into the sea cave because this is the original Batman sea cave. Sea cave. It does require a scramble across some rocks and you're just take it easy. If someone near, near you needs a hand, give them a hand. We'll go over there. We'll, we'll, I, may, I may talk some more around the corner here, but if it's depending on how the crowd goes, we'll go over and look up and see there's no bats and there's, as far as we know, um, there's nothing that's gonna poop on you. So <laughs> it's a really... Again, we've been talking about, while we're waiting to go into the cave, we can look some more at the great geology here. See the fault? You can clearly see the fault there where this got dragged down and that got pushed up. You can that's see... The area there where it's yeah, see the line? You can see the fault line right oh, there. Okay. And then see this brown? You know, it's not always a fault of like one huge earthquake. A lot of this is under the earth and it's happening almost slowly because you've got unconsolidated sediments that are sitting there and, you know, lava's pushing it up this way and causing it to tilt and so it it rips essentially and then see you can see this brown layer how broken up it is but that's all one layer that's been altered and then that may be it again over here and then you pick it up again over here so you can see you know that, that there's some consistency across here but we've had all kinds of jumbling up in the ocean probably not too long after it was deposited we had a lot of these changes happen That over there is the rotor from the pump for the old marine land property, where they pump the sea water up into the, into the park. And I think he talked to you, this is all, where we're standing now is all gonna be open to the public. This is one of the public areas. Uh, they're gonna have, I think it's changing rooms and public bathrooms, right? We walked past where those will be on the way down here. They're gonna improve this, so it's gonna be a public access area. They expect to have, you know, kayak and, and scuba diving here and lots of public things here. I mean, I'm not that familiar with the details of it, but from our pre-walk when we came down here, they are going to be doing a lot with this. This is the public, one of the public areas. Then, of course, all around the outside of the project are habitat areas with trails through them. So there's going to be a large, and then there's a new 50 car parking lot on the far side, which we'll see toward the end, where, um, you know, you can come and park and hike through all these trails. So this is part of the no, this is part of the property. Yes, you will have public access on this. All right, let's go see if we can get in line to go in the cave. Um, I don't think so. Who, who is our marine land expert? Did oh, that was the Bat Cave, and this area is where Sea Hunt was filmed. For those of you who remember Sea Hunt, um, the Long Point property has been used for lots and lots of movies. So. Um, 
lots of locations. And this cave pops up. You'd be surprised how often you see this cave appear in different movies. So it's not especially low, but it's the lowest Saturday tide, second Saturday tide we could find. <laughs> okay. So. And this is what. been another well, minute the yeah <laughs> any questions about the cave yeah tell us about the cave did you already well i talked a little <laughs> bit i can talk a little more um the cave is where there was another fault and you can actually see that there's a different kind of rock in the crack that was a little more um erodible and when the ocean came in that's where it decided to break the rock away um you can see where the slick insides were if you saw the scratches on the wall where it was there um you have that kind of thing all along this peninsula at the points. You know, a lot of the points have caves in them because you have had all this, that's where all the volcanic activity was concentrated. Over below Oceanfront Estates, um, you can't go down to it, but there's an area you can look down and you can see, a, um, I forget what they call it, there's a special name for it, but it's concentric circles of lava. 
So the lava came up out of a hole in the middle and went out c concentrically. Up in Portuguese Bend, there's an area that has pillow lava. You know, if you go to Hawaii and you see the lava coming out into the ocean, going and making all these little lumpy things, they call that pillow lava, and we have pillow lava here. So we have a lot of cool stuff going on. A lot of people ask me about the, um, the beans. Uh, in our, we always do a practice walk the week before we do the nature walk. So all the walk leaders are saying more or less the same things, or at least we're not contradicting each other horribly. And uh, we're pretty sure that those are just things that washed in from the pier. There used to be a pier at Marineland. Uh, washed away, I think, in the 70s. Anybody know for sure? Um, but as I was saying, with talking about the fossil rocks, the storms can move amazingly big things. And you know, they get jammed in there and they haven't been washed out since then. So. Yes? How far back does it go and when can we go back to clean? Or how often is it you cleaned out? Um, I don't think the cave has been cleaned out very long. One of the things now that we're managing Abalone Cove and some of these other areas is to add coastal cleanup days. Well, they already have them in Abalone Cove, and in fact, one is coming up in September. You should all come and help us. Uh, but it's the same day as uh, a, a volunteer day for the Land Conservancy. Uh, we'll probably be starting to do other areas, like the Trump National Beaches badly need cleaning up. Those have not been put into the preserve yet, because they are still being governed by the habitat conservation plan that that project had to do to get permission to build. But once the Fish and Game and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Fish and Game say, yep, you did what you promised you'd do in return for the right to develop, all of those properties get managed by the Land Conservancy as part of the preserve. They become the property of the city, though they have to pay for the, man for the uh, maintenance forever. So, you know, so all of these coastal areas will be under management by the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy. One of the things that we're doing right now is working on the public use master plan for the 1200 acre preserve. And this is a plan to say, you know, where will we have official trails? Who will use the trails? Which of course no one feels strongly about. Um, you know, where will we have access points? You know, how are we going to complete the coastal trail? And the Annenberg Foundation not only gave us a million dollars toward buying the land, they also gave us funding to do a vision plan. They said, you have this opportunity to plan for all these open spaces. Maybe you should think bigger and also plan for the city land. So we're looking at all of the city parks as well to say, how do we tie the coastal trail together? How do we make the same kind of informational materials available for the whole length? It's a great opportunity for the city and both those processes are just starting. If you want more information about that, you can look at the city webpage or the Land Conservancy webpage. Um, ours is in the process of a lot of updating right now, um, but some of it's there. And uh, it's a really interesting process that we, we welcome pe par public participation. There'll be lots of opportunities for the public to comment on different versions of the plan. Question. So is the, is the vision is to have one continuous coastal trail? Yes, that has always what, been the vision. From what point to what point? Well, it's within Rancho Palos Verdes is the process we're doing now. That doesn't mean that's the, the California Coastal Conservancy, which gave us a million dollars toward the acquisition. That's one of their top priorities is to build a California coastal trail from the northern border of California to down to Mexico. Um, and they're a potential funder for some stuff that we might want to do here at some point. So as a community, we need to decide, you know, how improved do we want it to be? What do we want it to look like? What kind of educational things? How do we tie the different properties together? How do we work with what's already been done? Lots of cool stuff. It's going to be great. So, this all right. Is oh yeah. I don't know. There's a little little a butterfly there, or a moth. I'm not sure. You'll see. It's a butterfly because the wings are open. Okay. Well, it's a moth because the wings are open. Butterflies yeah. close their wings. Ah, very good. See, I love the naturalists in the group. All right, we're going to head up, and then we're going to go out on that shoulder and wind our way Question. through the Mar Marineland property. Yes? How far is the cave? How far back does it go? Oh, it goes, what, 40, 50 feet? Oh, that long? It gets little at the back, but it actually goes pretty far. It gets skinnier and skinnier as you go back. Beyond the... Hi, we're rolling. This area, this is the walk that, as a condition of approval, they were required to keep open. Uh, I don't, I'm not, they may even be required to keep it open during construction though. I would be surprised if they were a lot required to keep it open every day. I mean, every project has certain things they're doing, they just can't keep it open. It's open from, I think, 9 a.m. to 4 now, 
Um, but what we're about to do, which is to go into the property, hasn't been, no one's been able to do for 20, I don't know, 10 years since it closed down, 15, 20 years. So we're going to go into the area that's been closed off. And of course, it's about to be closed off again because they're going to start construction on this property. But again, this will remain public access through much of the process and uh, the new trails, when they're done, will provide pr public access to this whole area. So we're going to go walk this way now. This is an area that, um, this is, there's going to be a trail connection eventually. Um, this is not one of their requirements, but it's in the city's conceptual trails fund to connect here to the corner of the street that we were going to have you park on. Um, and there's a, a city park, a little tiny city park over there on that bluff called Vanderlip Park. This is also, and this is also the site where you can find some very nice barite crystals. Though people come and dig holes, which is a very bad and very dangerous thing to try to pull stuff off the cliff. People shouldn't do that. But I actually bought at the Tucson Mineral Show a very nice specimen of barite from here that was collected quite some time ago. Some very beautiful crystals. So, you know, it's an extraordinary site for a lot of reasons. Yes? Will they be removing the old pump house? I, I think so, yes. Yes. <coughs> Barbara, is the Vanderlip Park where they're fencing it's I think, I think it's actually further down and has nicer fencing. I think it's, it's not right above the cave because there's houses there. It's a little way down. It's like two or three houses down. That's what I think. Okay, let's go this way. Our area, of course, this is the migration route for the Pacific Gray Whale. They come very close to the coast here. The whale watchers actually sit at, at the interpretive center counting them going by. Um, toward their, the, where they have their babies in Mexico and where they spend the summer. Then they turn around and head back up to Alaska where, do I have it backwards? No, yes, yeah, so where they spend the winter. Um, when we were doing our practice walk a week ago, we saw a blue whale out there. There's a blue whale that's been hanging out off the coast and we saw it out there spouting. It was amazing. So you never know what you're going to get to see here. The other distinction, dubious as it is, of our, off our coastline is that we have the world's largest deposit of DDT off our coast. Came from Montrose Chemical, which was up in Carson. And, you know, at the time, they, I don't, you know, who knows, but when they cleaned out a tank, they would dump it into the sewer system. They, when they had a little extra, they just dump it out and it would go out the White Point Outfall in San Pedro, a mile off the coast. And then the currents have taken it and spread it in a big arc all around the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Well, what to do about it? Um, it was killing all the pelicans because they were eating the fish and accumulating the DDT and it was um, causing their, their shells to break and that's why the pelican was placed in the endangered species list. Uh, they stopped producing it and, it's, and the DDT that's out there is a little bit capped. So it hasn't been as big a problem and that's partly why the pelican, the brown pelican, is back. And I, it's either off or planned to be taken off the endangered species list. But that DDT is still out there and it's a super fun site. They've spent a lot of time and energy. Once in a while you'll see the science ships out there um, trying to, you know, sampling it. At one point they tried capping it. At one point they thought maybe they'd try to dig it up, but then it's going to stir it all up. And then where do you take it? And, you know, it's, it's a real problem. So it's going to cost literally, I think, billions of dollars if you were to try to cover it all up. After hundreds of years, it will, nothing eats DDT. So it doesn't really go away, but it does decompose very, very slowly. So in a couple hundred years, its effects will be mitigated. One of the things that they've done now is they have a, uh, the Montrose Chemical uh, Settlement Fund, and they've been trying to educate fishermen um, not to eat the, the bottom feeders and uh, trying to do some restoration for some of the birds and so forth that were impacted. So that's happening right now. Uh, of course, um, the kelp beds all went away, and I, I can't tell if there's kelp out there. There's other, yeah, that's not kelp, that's seaweed. I think there's kelp out there, and that, of course the kelp was, was hurt by the DDT as well. What about all the kelp harvesting that went on? The kelp harvesting, by all accounts, and I just read something about this, does not hurt the kelp. The kelp can grow up to two feet a day. It's one of the fastest growing plants in, or creatures in the world. And uh, those harvesters are like lawnmowers. They just cut, up, cut off the top two feet. A much bigger problem for the kelp, let me see if I get this straight, is, is it the sea urchins? That there's, no, there's no more sea otters, and the sea otters ate the sea urchins, and the sea urchins destroy the, the things that hold the, the, the kelp roots. to the, the hold fast, that holds the kelp down. 
So, you know, it's all a balance out there. And once you meddle with it, you know, it makes a big, big mess. But it's some of it's coming back, and I think uh, we're cleaning up certainly what we put into the ocean. Though how we're going to get rid of all the all the stuff that's in the ocean already is another matter entirely, which we can't solve today. This is a good spot to sort of look at the south side of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. You can see uh, the landslide. You can see the back of the cliff at Forestall, which is was a quarry, a rock quarry, many years ago. All of that green land that you pretty much see over there is now in the Portuguese Bend Nature Preserve. Everything you see there. Um, and down to the ocean here in Abalone Cove. So we've got these 1,200 acres. People are starting to talk about the pump, which is going to figure out public access. We've also spent this year having um, protocol level gnat catcher surveys. Gnat catchers are these little endangered birds. They have gray heads and they're they're um, not the most efficient birds in the world. They don't catch gnats, they don't eat gnats, they don't even have nothing to do with gnats actually. They eat little bugs that crawl around on plants. They can have three or four nests a year, but they're just slow and easy prey for a lot of other birds. And when their habitat is destroyed, they can't, they, they sometimes nest in other species, but mostly they need the coastal sage scrub to live. So that's our key species. And one of the things just briefly to talk about is the fact that um, the thing that made this preserve possible is something called the Natural Communities Conservation Plan. And this was something started um, under Bruce Babbitt um, to say instead of having fights between developers and environmentalists and using the Endangered Species Act, which doesn't work very well, it waits to something's almost extinct and then it stops all activity, doesn't save the creature well, it's not fair to property owners. What if we did regional multi-species planning? And Pete Wilson, who was the governor of California at the time, brought together the environmental community and the building community and said, what if we try it here? And he agreed to try it here in Southern California using the gnat catcher as one of the lead species. City of Rancho Palos Verdes in 1996, the city council signed us up for an NCCP, got some money from the federal government to help with the planning. And it's because of that, finally all these years later that we were able to get the funding to do that and of course we're still we would still like to buy what's called the filiorum parcel where Jim York is uh, proposing a number of developments again the Land Conservancy doesn't take a position on that we just try to say for a willing seller we can put the deal together and we have additional commitments from the state if we can get a deal with Jim York so stay tuned who knows what's going to happen but all this monitoring our obligation under this plan is to do this monitoring of all the creatures, do a lot of um, studying to do five acres of restoration a year. So we're now busy trying to get our hands around taking care of this 1200 acre preserve. So it's, 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 a, it's hard because it's not quite as exciting to go to the community and say, save the land, as to say, help us take care of the land. But we're really excited about what we're doing and and the uh, stewardship and so forth that's taking place and we're going to have a lot more exciting news about the endangered species and some of the things that we've found as we move forward in taking care of this big preserve. Pampas grass! Ah. This is just one little tiny patch of habitat that's on this property, the only one I saw, so I thought we should just stop briefly and look at it. You can see the sagebrush here, this feathery plant. That's the most important plant in coastal sage scrub. That's where the gnat catcher nests. It's artemisia for you gardeners. Um, the sages are salvias. Um, it's very aromatic. They make male colognes uh, from it because it's such a manly scent. And of course, <laughs> then we have, these are the ashy leaf buckwheat, but it's a cousin of this buckwheat that the El Segundo blue butterfly, which is a threatened species, uh, is found on. And on the, on the edge of this property, you can find the El Segundo blue butterflies. And we just did a survey. And this isn't in the preserve yet, but we did it below the Interpretive Center and below Oceanfront Estates and at the fishing access and found four different colonies of El Segundo blue butterflies that they didn't know were there. They thought maybe, but now we know. So it's really exciting and different. Over there is where the pier was. There was a big pier, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the 70s that a big storm took out the pier. Anybody know? Anyway, there was a quite a large pier that went off here, and then this is also where the outfall was. So as I, some of you may have heard me say before, that when 
when they put the new water in the tanks, they'd pump the tanks down, and the tanks are always full of little bits of fish and leftover stuff and droppings and everything, and they would pump that into the ocean there. So this was like, this was like the cafeteria. So there were sea lions evidently all over these rocks, and as we go up into the property, we're going to go to the restaurant that was right near the edge. Um, anybody remember the name of it? Galley West. The Galley West. Correct. See? Yes, I know. There's a lot of people that this, this means a lot to. So um, this property has been closed off since, um, well, you know, Marine Glen closed in 86, and then a guy named uh, Monaghan bought it. He tried to put a 1,200-room hotel here. You will hear people say that the environmentalists kept this from being developed. That is not true. If he had had a smaller hotel, I don't know, but he probably could have gotten it approved. But 1,200 rooms, everybody said, was way out of scale for this property. Then he went bankrupt, and it was bought by the Resolution Trust. And then that's when it was purchased and has been in this ownership. And then the Lowe's bought it from York um, after taking it through the whole entitlement process. So um, you heard a little bit about that at the beginning. Over here, these orange-colored rocks, that's the thing rock. It's really, really hot. It's coming up. And you can just see the top of it right there, and then the sedimentary rocks that got pushed aside as, as, as it came up. Oh, one more thing. Acacias. This is, a, this is a tree from Africa. This one right here. Slow, uh, very fast growing, very invasive shrubby trees. It has thousands and thousands of seeds. You can see the seed pods on it. It also is very bad for fire. It catches fire very easily. It has a resin. And those seeds are like perfectly designed to fly in the air and land burning on your, on your shake roof. So, you know, the Land Conservancy, like, eucalyptus are not especially invasive. We don't want to get rid of eucalyptus trees. But acacias, we are probably going to take out some acacias. And we're going to take out the fan palms because they're very invasive when we have a restoration project. We're not going to do it just randomly. But if there's an area we're trying to get back to the native habitat, and we are going to be continuing to plant native trees. There are some beautiful native trees. Elderberries can get 30, 40 feet high. The thing about it is there's always a transition where the trees you plant, you can't afford to plant 20 foot tall trees. You have to plant little trees, but eventually the restored areas will have beautiful trees on them again. In Forestall, there's a canyon that we did a restoration on three years ago, I think it is now, and we planted, you know, essentially with willows. You almost take a stick, stick it in the ground. I mean, we do it at the nursery first, so it's um, got a few leaves on it, but they're now 25 feet tall, and they look beautiful. They really do. Which I might just mention our plant nursery. Um, we work with the Navy at the field depot in San Pedro. Um, it's restricted, but um, we occasionally have volunteer days if you ever want to come and see. And we have a full native plant nursery there. And this year we're growing 100,000 plants. We're growing plants for this project and growing some more plants for, for Trump National and uh, plants for all of our properties. And we grow them from seed that's collected here locally. And one of the things we'd like to start sometime is have a seed collecting group because people who like to hike and run might be willing to collect seed for us. It's very time consuming and if people are out there, if nothing else, if, they, if we can train them to at least call us and say it's ready, that saves us a lot of time because then we don't have to keep checking to see if a particular kind of seed. We don't have it in place yet. We're sort of thinking, you know, six months we'll, we'll, we'll introduce that. But I think it's something people might like to help us with. We're going to need lots of volunteer help to get through this next stage, but we're having volunteer days almost every Saturday, and uh, people have a really good time. People love to plant. It's really fun. Next spring, we're going to be planting everywhere. Do you have any PV blue down here? No. The Palos Verdes blue butterfly at this point is only found though. Half an hour. Half an hour, are you okay? Well, I. <laughs> Greenland's demise. Well, evidently it had not been well cared for and it was in bad financial straits, but um, there were, a law was passed that forbid live capture of killer whales. SeaWorld had lots of female killer whales in its various shows around the country, but not a single 
male killer whale that could impregnate a fe all these females. So that's why they wanted Corky. And so they offered evidently quite a bit of money for Corky. And the Marineland people said, he's our star attraction. We're not going to sell you Corky. And that's why they ended up buying the whole park. I mean, they did want to um, reduce competition for SeaWorld, but it was also just straight out. They needed that, <laughs> they needed that potent uh, killer whale. So that, that, I, I've been told that on pretty good authority. This is the old Galley West restaurant, I understand, and uh, all of this will be gone. I think this, there, the coastal trail goes all through there with a, with a habitat buffer. And then there's going to be little lookout points with information along the way that we're hoping through this vision plan to kind of tie all of this, even the interpretive materials here, and they're being very cooperative, um, together so that along the whole coast here, you'll have a wonderful experience when you come hiking. So I think it'll be great. So it'll go through to the lighthouse then from here? It will. Well, we have to get the lighthouse. Oh. Now, the lighthouse, the city's general plan calls for trying to acquire the lighthouse. Oh. Right now, there are three families living there. Um, if nothing else, we'd like to get permission to run a trail through it, and we'd like to manage the bluff areas because there may be more El Segundo blue butterflies there. It would be good to know that. And then there's a little knoll, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, on PV Drive South, right next to the fishing access, that is covered with a, a fleshy plant that has sort of pointy gray, pointy leaves. That's called a Dudleya, and it's one of our locally rare plants. It's one of the best places to see Dudleyas. They're, they're all over this knoll, facing north. It's the only place they grow fa facing north. And it'd be nice to get that in the preserve because one of the things that we're gonna be monitoring is the health of Dudleyas, and we'd like to get that little clump into the preserve. So we're, um, every, we're, we're gonna be talking to the Coast Guard to see what we could work out. Pro a better case can be made for turning the lighthouse over to public um, use if we have a plan. You know, so it's tied into what we wanna do with it. There are no, it's not being used, there's no people there running the lighthouse. The people there work in San Pedro. That lighthouse is completely automatic. And all over the country, the government is turning lighthouses over. They generally turn the lighthouse itself over to the auxiliary group that likes to run lighthouses. And then the properties to a historic group, to a preservation group. And I can imagine we can find someone here like us to help uh, <laughs> manage that property if it becomes available for public access and then habitat restoration. So. It could be great. We'll see what happens. Stay tuned. <laughs> this is kind of interesting. This is a pump station that took all of the the runoff from the toilets and the and you know all of the the wastewater from the property and pumped it back up to the sewer line, which you know goes along with a big sewer line that goes along the south side of the peninsula. Had some issues with ocean trails, if you remember. But um, this pumped the, all, all that water up into that sewer line. Well, it's still operational, and as they demolish things, they're filling in all the pipes with cement, but they want to make sure that they haven't missed something. So they're going to leave it running till they're sure that there's nothing that's draining into it that ought to be pumped up. So okay. it's still functioning now, and it'll be replaced. I think he talked to you a little about the bioswale system and what they're going to be doing with their stormwater on that property and all of the other, you know, the various other, they're going to put in a whole new system for um, uh, getting this, the uh, sewage up into the sewer line. Of course, one of the things that they've just required, which he was telling me about, which I thought was interesting, is, you know, those spills they've just had on the beach where the generators failed. Now they're going to re require that every pumping station have an emergency generator, but they're about as big as a bus. And they're in, you know, beautiful spots. So, you know, the trade-off of how do you get that there? It, it, it'll be interesting. We'll see it play out. But you know, so well, they got to have an emergency generator. Well, that's easy. there's some other issues to be thought about before they go doing that. So just one of those public policy issues that is always interesting. Getting uh, getting things from below the sewer line up to the sewer line is always a challenge. Yeah, it's worth walking up here because you have the really pretty view of the lighthouse. Yeah. Plus, I like the exercise. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the area that will be part of the uh, the walkway around the edge with the habitat. You can see that they're digging up some of the trees and preserving them. In fact, they wanted to save those trees, and it was because of those trees that the lo some of the people from the local Native Plant Society appealed this project to the Coastal Commission. 
and then that ended up making it take a lot longer to get its approvals. But th the Coastal Commission actually agreed that these trees were historic and let them keep them. So you, as we walk back, you're going to see a number of trees that they're digging up and, and preserving to replant when the project is done. And you can see, so the trail will go all around here and then over, you can see where those cars are parked there. That's called the fishing access. It's actually a wonderful little spot. It's a steep trail down to the ocean, but it's, it's not that hard a trail. And you can get down to the rocks and they'll be adding another 50 car parking lot on this side. This is a good spot. You can also see this back of the city hall property where the farm is. And then you can see some really nice habitat next to it. We just finished our gnat catcher monitoring and there are six pair of gnat catchers over there. So then two pair of cactus wrens. So it, yeah, it's really exciting to see what's here and to think about what we can do to increase the numbers of all these rare species. We're doing rare wildflower monitoring and we're gonna have a, a report probably in about three months on you know, a really good look at everything that's here. Um, good place to just talk about the coastal trail again. It would be really nice to get it through the lighthouse property through around here. Then there's a bit that's difficult. That's the area that's been developed at the density that the county wanted this place de developed at. That triggered, may maybe some of you are part of it, the uh, incorporation of Rancho Palos Verdes because this section this way, you know, the intensity of the homes there, if you look down on it, is what they had planned for this entire coastline. Um, Multi-story condos, it would have been a very different place if those folks hadn't gotten together and founded this city. So we're very fortunate that they did. Standing right here in what was Baja Reef, which was one of the last things they built at Marine Land, trying to get people to, uh, you know, to build up the uh, visitors. Marine Land is certainly very special to the history of this peninsula. You know, ironically, you could never put it back. People would go berserk at the thought of the traffic and everything else, but um, there's a lot of good memories about it. There's evidently an entire, I, I came upon it today just trying to refresh myself on the history. There's a Marine Land History Association now that has a very nice web page that lists all the books that you can buy about it. Um, you know, he was telling me about, what's the name of the book you were talking about? Ah, LU. Okay, and so lots of good resources. Um, I know that the Interpretive Center has a, an exhibit, and if any of you are looking for a nice place to visit on, a, on an afternoon, go over to the New Point Vicente Interpretive Center. It's just delightful. It's, it's fabulous, so we really appreciate it. Um, on, the Land Conservancy is a nonprofit group. Um, we can't do our job unless people volunteer for us. We want everyone to feel really part of what we do. We're about to start putting together a lot more committees and advisory committees so we can get the community really part of everything we do and of course as with any nonprofit we we live on um, donations from the community so anything you feel inspired to do we would appreciate more information about what we're doing check our web page which is www.pvplc.org our next walk is at the botanic garden something we've never done before we try to do new war walks our walk flyer will be out in January will be, uh, you'll see next year's walks. We ought to be having our meeting shortly. And we always try to throw in some of the old standards and some of the new walks every year. So we hope you'll continue to join us. And thank you very much for coming today. And thank you to the whole community for making the preservation happen that we're, together we've been able to accomplish. So thank you all very much. <laughs>